Hello and welcome to Tomorrow Orbit 12.23. <laughs> Today we have got so much to talk about. Before we do that, just yeah. quick little introductions for all of us that are going to be talking to you here today. I'm all Jared. All of us. Uh, yeah, all two of us that are talking <laughs> to you today. Uh, I'm Jared, and I'm also joined by my co-host, Jade, today. And we are going to be looking at what has happened so far in 2019, because we're a little more than halfway through 2019. And it's always good to kind of just look back and see- Self-reflect. How you're, yeah, just how am I doing? How's and space doing? Exactly, and we're kind of going to take a look at what humanity has been doing with all these things. And uh, we're just going to go right out to the asteroid belt to get things started uh, with one of per my personal favorite missions, which has been busy, 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 busy <laughs> this year, which is Hayabusa 2. This is a mission from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency out to asteroid Ryugu, and it launched back in 2014. It arrived last year, and you could see it right there, mm -hmm. taking a sample from the surface of asteroid Ryugu. Hayabusa 2 is a follow-on to their first Hayabusa mission, which was rife with problems. It was, it was quite literally the robotic spacecraft equivalent of Apollo 13. Um, and uh, this has been sped up significantly, by the way. Um, here's the real-time version of, uh, of what Hayabusa 2 did. Amazing. Uh, but back in February... And just, uh, just a couple weeks ago, in July, on July 11th, uh, Hayabusa 2 descended down to the surface of Ryugu, and when it detected that it was close enough, it fired a bullet made out of tantalum, which is a element that we do not expect to find in asteroids. And it ends up shooting that debris up into a horn that kind of like scoops it up. Because Hayabusa 2 is a sample return mission. It's going to be bringing this back uh, to us here on Earth to study. And this is you know, pretty exciting to me, the, at least. Yeah, I mean, it's the first of its kind, really. Yeah. I mean, I mean Hayabusa <laughs> originally did do sample return from an asteroid called Itokawa, uh -huh. but it had problems. Exactly. So it only brought back, like... A couple grams. Exactly. Like a couple of grains of dust, basically, is what it brought back. Which this, is great dust. The dust yeah. was fine. This is, I think this is where it's going to fire the bullet right into the surface of Ryugu here. And I just love that you could see all these rocks here, too. That tells us that Ryugu is not like a solid rock. It's a, what we call a rubble pile. So it's a bunch of rocks <clears throat> all gravitationally bound to each other. And there we go. We fired the bullet in. So and there goes all the debris out. Uh, escape velocity, by the way, from the surface of Ryugu is about a tenth of a meter per second. So, um, so you could like get up out of bed and fly off of the surface <laughs> of Ryugu there. So look at this absolute mess that we've made here. Gosh um, darn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to us. Yeah. And uh, the, the neat thing about this, we'll get these samples back in December of 2020, mm -hmm. and that should allow us to really get a up-close look at what these asteroids are made yeah. of. Yeah. Which is good, because asteroids can hit the Earth. So, like, if you know what an asteroid's made out of, You'll you... Know it's like to... It's like know your enemy. Yeah. You know, you can figure out how From to... the inside out. It. Yeah, you can figure out, like, how hard do I have to kick the asteroid? Exactly. You know, to get it, Armageddon to get it, it, you know? Exactly. How do we get Aerosmith to come sing a song while we destroy it? But this has huge implications, too, for commercial mining, future, mm -hmm. potentially of, you know, these, like, different solar system objects and whatnot. And then like once we discover like what it's actually made of and mm -hmm. like in what quantities and it's like, okay, well how commercially viable is this to go out there and whatnot. So I see this opening up some crazy doors. Absolutely. Yeah, we can we can look at the uh, sort of like the material the metal content of this asteroid here. And then also Ryugu is a very interesting kind of asteroid. It's a C G type asteroid. So Ooh. C means that it's got it's rich in carbon. Which dark. basically three out of every four asteroids are a C type, mm -hmm. um, and then it's also a G type, which means that it has lot. It may have lots of clays and micas in it, which are formed in typically wet environments. Or what's another word for wet uh, that you like saying? Moist. Oh, it's moist. Moist. So a moist environment. Moist. Um, 
more and moist. The thing about that is, is that you can you can use that carbon for development of like materials and oh, other absolutely. things you may have out there. You can also use those clays and micas to actually extract water. Exactly. Out of it. And there you go. Voila! You could build your spaceship and fuel it up right at an asteroid. And actually, we've had a couple guests on. Um, Momentus is one of them that mm -hmm. I can think of that talked about actually pulling water out of asteroids and comets and using it as fuel. Sucking them dry. Yeah, and literally not like we're going to remove the hydrogen and the oxygen from each other, just like hitting water with a little microwave beam and then sending that excited water out of a <laughs> <Yeah>. nozzle. <Wow. laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> there, yeah. And uh, just to let you know, this, uh, this, this specific story was suggested to us by Fitterion on community.tmro.tv. Thank we put, you, Fitterion. We put a little post up there, and we're basically like, hey, what would you like to see us talk about on that there? Uh, and, the whole, and people replied, and you were very much in agreement with what we were thinking, so uh, that means that we got it there. That and is rubbly. Yeah, look at that. That is just absolutely beautiful. Um, there you go. Take a look at this um, here. And uh, this right here, this crater was specifically caused uh, by a vehicle that they had that uh, or not a vehicle, excuse me, a uh, kinetic system. I, I really don't know how to describe it other than that way. <laughs> um, a kinetic system that fired a shape charge that sent a bit of copper down and it made a 10 meter crater on the Intentionally? surface. Intentionally? Yeah, and this is two weeks ago when Hayabusa dipped down into that crater and grabbed that material. So this is not yeah. surface material it's grabbing. This is material below the surface. Oh, so got that, it. So then we can like actually study even deeper. Down exactly. Into it. So we're no longer looking at stuff that's influenced by the sun. We're looking at stuff that's been relatively covered like legit. up by it there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I, I, a couple of you were saying that you like this is some amazing footage you've never seen before. Yeah, this is fantastic. I just found out this morning too. I was looking on Twitter and talking to some folks. This camera was publicly funded. Like, yes. this camera was not going to be here, but then the, JAXA was like, hey, you know, who would want to pay to have a camera there? And just a ton of people spent <laughs> money to make it happen. That's amazing. So, so yeah. So Oh, I love that. What, I, an, uh, what an awesome story. And I can't wait to see samples. Can't yeah. wait to see samples. Can't wait to see samples. So, because why look at the universe when you could go out and touch it? So, disturb it, you know. Taste it. Taste Make it. a mess of it. Yeah, eat it. Put holes in it. So, Shoot it. Yeah, you know? uh, yeah. We, we shot first. <laughs> so, that's what's up. There it so, is. That's the shirt. Earth shot first. Mm. So, yeah. That's, that's our that's our reputation in the cosmos now. Yeah, well, unfortunately. There it is. Yeah. So. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> well, that was lovely. Yes. Um. So, yeah. Speaking of rocky bodies in the solar system, <laughs> there is one called Mars. And it Are happens sure about to be... That? Uh, it's a friend of ours. It's a it's a neighbor planet, of course. And yeah. you can't talk about Mars without its amazing rovers. And you can't talk about the rovers without mentioning good old Opportunity. Oppie. A.K.A. Oppie. Now, Oppie. in terms of, I mean, every single rover we've ever sent to Mars is absolutely magnificent. But this one, I feel like, truly touched the hearts of people because it was, um... It, well, the reason we bring it up, it says in 2019, it was uh, February 13th, I believe, we officially called it an end. We officially said goodbye mm -hmm. um, after a giant dust storm the previous year had basically kind of rendered it Yeah, the worst, unresponsive. The worst dust storm uh, in at least human recorded history that Absolutely. we've ever seen on Mars. So it was it was like a killer storm, exactly, so. Literally. Mm -hmm. And so it was a 2004 mission. It was only supposed to last for 90 days. It lasted for 15 years. Dang. I'll tell you something. If I get an assignment and I'm only supposed to do it for three months, I'm not going to continue on for 15 years. But this guy <laughs> totally did. <laughs> but I did. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go to college for a semester 15 years <laughs> okay. later. Okay, Van so. Wilder. But, and also, we can't understate <laughs> the science that opportunity uh, returned to us because oh some of my favorite discoveries about Mars were basically – opportunity's fault. So for instance, uh, <laughs> we talk a lot about the habitability, um, potential hab habitability of Mars. <laughs> and um, opportunity was, you know, one of the machines that truly opened our eyes to the fact that Mars was once pretty Earth-like. It was once very juicy, or shall I say moist. And it was once uh, pretty supple, um, able to potentially support life. And the way, you know, so specifically, I want to bring up the discovery of hematite. Opportunity took some photos of these uh, cute little blueberry things on the surface. Who left those <laughs> snacks? Oh, yes, here they are. Who at JPL <laughs> left the snacks in the rover? Those snozberries are these. Um, and essentially, hematite only forms this globular shape when under the presence of constant flowing liquid water and mm -hmm. fresh water at that. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And, it, you know, it's little globs of iron oxide that kind of bond together like that. And yeah. Helps. And, you know, when you hear about iron oxide, a lot of us think basically like rust. Oh, no, yeah. it's been ruined. But no, iron oxide <laughs> indicates that chemistry mm -hmm. is occurring in chemistry, kind of important for life. Just a little bit. Um, yeah. And a neat thing about Oppie is that... Um, you know, Oppie was a part of a dual mission with two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. Yes. Spirit landed first. Um, Spirit was targeted to an area that was expected to have had water and ended up basically landing in the middle of a volcanic rock plane. Um, luckily, later on in its mission, a couple years later, Spirit did find evidence of geothermal springs, like hot springs mm -hmm. and stuff on the surface, which now <clears throat> I want to go back in time and sit on some hot springs right? on Mars. Right, it's like a spa on that would Mars. Be like, ooh, yeah, this is I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, dies <laughs> <die>. immediately. <laughs> um, but Opportunity literally landed on the surface. First of all, Opportunity, they use that airbag system. This and. Uh, opportunity and spirit are right on the limit of the weight that you can use for the airbag system. Yeah. Um, so that's it. We that's why Curiosity moved to the Sky Crane and why Mars 2020 will use Sky Crane Improved, I guess. Um, so it bounced on the surface and it literally rolled into a crater. <laughs> like we just like hit like this huge, like this massive golf swing towards Mars. Mars. And we got a hole in one by doing that. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh. You know, exactly. how, how good was that? And then, you know, spirit had to battle. It had to fight for everything it did. And opportunity just like opened up the pedals and took photos. And there was bedrock with the hematite right next to it. Oh, beautiful. So, and it was just like, you overachiever. You, you poetic so, machine. Both and of I them, they're good rovers, Brent. Um, but, <laughs> but I swear, uh, there's, there's just something about op opportunity and uh yeah like, uh, i love that theory and actually yeah. says and mm -hmm. it's why i really wanted to talk about this is oppie is the rover which made robots alive for me mm -hmm. and the thing about especially this show in general but this particular episode we want to talk about like the technical and the, the cool science behind it yeah but really what we want to talk about is the heart of these stories mm -hmm. and the heart i think with opportunity is the fact that um it really did. Like people were cheering Oppie on. Oppie became this like character, and like the whole hashtag farewell Oppie thing that started to happen on Twitter, like following the farewell, was like tear inducing. Yeah. You know, it's like we were. It's like uh, it's like what Wally -E did for robots and Pixar. Yeah. But anyways. Well, I mean, I'll admit I cried a little bit hearing that Oppie was done. So right. That was a, that was like a really. And then the the last sent, the last uh, update was my battery is low and it's getting dark. Oh, it's like, come on, man. You, know, you know how to get that's us. Just, uh, that's, like, that's like the line, like the robot sidekick in a movie says yeah. as they're dying, you know, and then they shut <laughs> Daisy. Up. Yeah, just Daisy. <laughs> right before it ends. Exactly. End it all. I can't do this anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Oppie, once again. And we actually yeah. do have an episode where we did do like a nice comprehensive farewell to Opportunity. So. Yeah, I think it was the Space News uh, segment earlier this year, right? Yeah, so, so you just dig through those yeah. archives. Goodbye, Oppie. Um, and then uh, we also did have someone who drove uh, one of the rovers as well. That's uh, right. Last year on, yeah. uh, in Orbit 11. So feel free to dig in through Orbit 11 and look at that um, as well. Absolutely. So, and in something in Orbit 11 that we talked about uh, actually was the test flight of Falcon Heavy, which happened back in February of 2018. Um, but... This year, you know, it only took 14 months. <laughs> Granted, it is rockets. Uh, but this year, Falcon Heavy finally went operational. So we're no longer just talking about how great would it be to have this big old triple this core big barrel. Old heavy Falcon. This, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> your heavy Falcon. Oh my gosh. You know, we're no longer just going to have this really great, you know, animation of all this stuff. We're going to have like fully operational. IRL. Here we are. It's fully operational now. It's been. Uh, officially approved. This is the Arab Sat 6A launch that happened on April 11th this year, which was the first successful triple core landing, by the way. Um, although the center core did end up falling over uh, on and uh, in, in uh, getting very badly damaged uh, with that there. So sort of, uh, you know, I, I love that meme that I saw on the internet that had a, uh, uh, um, what's his face? Uh, Ralph Wiggum sitting in the back of the bus uh, saying, you know, uh, chuckles, I'm in danger. <laughs> and the, the uh, tagline for it at the top was, uh, when you realize you're the center core of Falcon Heavy. So, because they, it's just, it's, it's a curse so far. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, the little note I see happening right there. That's pretty good. Uh, so, 
Falcon Heavy has, has, or Falcon 9 just itself has really lowered the cost dramatically. That was the goal of Falcon 9. Exactly. Lower the costs, will reusability work. I still stand by my thing that they're not reusable yet. Um, until you have rapid turnaround, then it'll be officially reusable. Got it. Um, they uh, refurbishable is what I would call them right now because you know space space shuttle was refurbishable. It also had very long turnarounds. But I mean, SpaceX is just speeding so fast that I mean, at this Seriously. point, it's almost becoming semantics to just yeah talk about it. Look at that beautiful tracking footage. My <laughs> gosh. Who's the oh. genius behind that? Gorgeous. Be Gorgeous. So, my work. so um, it's like a triple, I always call this the octoplume, but now it's like the, the trioctoplume or something um, at this point. And I love the onboard shots here too. It's just like, that is so gorgeous. And uh, yeah, I just, I can never get enough of, uh, of watching these. And I can never get enough of watching people watch these. Yeah, well. there you go. Because it's just always so It never gets old. That's the thing. Is I feel like it, your heart never stops skipping a beat when you see footage like this because it's like, I mean, as much as we're doing in space and as many advancements as we're making, it's still crazy to think about, like, just how far we've come and how much we're going to be doing. Yeah. And to see something like this, it's like, oh, yeah, we're humans. We did that. That's right. Yeah. And this is, you know, and just to remind myself, too, that we're relatively, we're still crawling at this point in terms of Compared our to, yeah. abilities in space Absolutely. So, like, and to think oh. that, oh, there we go. And to think Timber. that this is, this is crawling, you know, like, yeah. holy moly, that's, that's pretty wild with that there. And, uh, you know, Falcon Heavy just is, I mean, you could chuck. 64,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. It can send 17,000 kilograms to Mars, which is more than we have the ability to land on Mars right now, okay? We can, yeah, exactly. We can just barely do a ton on Mars. This is like 17 of them capable of doing that. That's incredible. Uh, one thing I'd really like to see it used for, maybe for Pluto. Oh, so yeah. It could do about 3,500 kilograms to Pluto. So exactly. Maybe we could get that Pluto orbiter, that Pluto super orbiter. Um, and maybe we'll be talking about something a little cold like that uh, a little bit later today. As well. <clears throat> yeah, most of course, definitely. Of course, we now know that Falcon Heavy is not going to be crew rated, and also it's going to eventually be replaced by Starship and Super Heavy. Um, so Falcon Heavy, even though it is here, its days are numbered, if mm -hmm. you will. Uh, but, I mean... It's still going to most certainly be used for quite a while. I mean, I, there's, there's just a lot of ability in Falcon Heavy. And in some cases, for some payloads, it's actually cheaper to fly it on a Falcon Heavy than it is to fly it on a Falcon 9. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I guess we'll have to see what the future holds for Falcon Heavy. And uh, definitely looking forward to more launches and uh, definitely looking forward to the curse of the center core being overcome eventually with that. So that's one heavy falcon. Yes, that is heavy. I had to put it. That's in. heavy, Doc. All right, and uh, okay, so uh, going from rockets <laughs> to <laughs> something more cosmological. Oh, um, cosmos. Uh, so actually, an another pretty amazing thing that happened this year was uh, the first direct imaging of a black hole. Oh my gosh! So yes. okay. So yeah. I'm gonna start with this. I'm gonna start with this. So before we had this beautiful image, which we will see shortly. When we thought of black holes and the different artistic renditions, like, this is the type of imagery we were given. And it's like, okay. Yeah. Like, so the black hole, obviously, you can't see it because the light does not bounce back off. It, it's mm -hmm. completely absorbed. But what you do see is, like, this basic, sorry, TV, this, like, gravitational disturbance yeah. around it. You see gravitational lensing. This is literally the light being bent by the just insane gravity and mass of mm -hmm. this object. Oh, look. There's Matthew McConaughey. Oh, hey, Matt. So, um, oh, yeah. Roddy McDowell's right behind me. There she is. So, yeah. um, so essentially, like, this is kind of like, so we did have to, like, finesse our imaginations. And it, again, the thing is, is that the black hole, the definition of it in, of, in and of itself is that you can't technically see it because the only reason yeah. you could see us is because there's light waves bouncing off of us going straight into your eye holes. <laughs> or to the CCDs the, that, that they that? have, which turns it into uh, yeah. magic. Magic particles, <laughs> and then the magic particles go, I'm gonna go ahead and from go. here through the through the air. We're gonna table that discussion to people's computers. <laughs> then then they come into in the <laughs> right into the eye holes. <laughs> uh, what can we say? Our producer right said he, he wanted us to be ourselves today, so this is what you get. Don't tell them that. <laughs> yeah, just 
Yes. <laughs> um, and so, um, and then uh, I believe we have the uh, image of the actual, yeah, there it is. So. Look at that thing. This is actually way more impressive. Like if you actually know what you're incredibly looking at. First of all, the amount of data and the amount of, this was taken with the, um, Event Horizon telescope, telescope Array. Which is 11 telescopes. Which is a bunch all of over the telescopes. Earth. Exactly. And it's a gigantic interferometer. Exactly. Which basically means that you take all the data from these telescopes. It's like 5 million you, terabytes. Uh, yeah, 5,000 5, trillion bytes of data. That, 5 petabytes. So it was actually so much data. 5 pedialytes. I 5 pedialytes. <laughs> And it was so. I, I just want to say this. It was so much data that they literally could not transfer it via like internet or anything like it. They just basically grabbed the hard drives <laughs> right out of the telescopes the and disc. flew them into the the data center where yeah. they were going to be crushed. And they used supercomputers to like generate this image. Mm -hmm. And 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 goodness, like look what we're looking at here. So what you're actually seeing is this like superheated glowy gas that is basically falling into this black hole. Yep. And um, this was taken in X-rays, like just different forms of yeah. basically X-rays, X-ray microwaves, uh, and combinations exactly. thereof with them. And so, not only was it a huge technological effort and accomplishment, but also black holes. I feel like are one of the more um, intriguing things in mm -hmm. science, especially astronomy. Like whenever some oh yeah and, oh it comes from the by the way I'm so sorry this is the galactic core of um, M87 right yes exactly so this is essentially what we're looking at right yeah. here. And M87 in the Virgo cluster about 55 million light years away from us. So pretty so, pretty far. Yeah, Not a necessarily a, a walk in the park, so, but yeah. um, essentially, you know, black holes are, I feel like, one of the most popular things to talk about in mm -hmm. pop science yes. because they're so gnarly. They're often represented in, like, sci-fi. And it's true. Like, they're probably one of the most interesting things that exist in the universe. Yeah. And now we have an actual direct image of them. And that's just kind of yeah. like mind boggling because like 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, you know, to, to think that we could capture an image like this, have the capability mm -hmm. to gather all this data, use 11 telescopes across the world to do that. Yeah. I mean. Even 30 years ago, uh, people were still doubting the existence of exactly. black holes. It wasn't until that team at UCLA in the late 80s and early 90s basically stared at the center of the Milky Way. <laughs> for an incredibly long Real amount hard. of time. Yeah. And over years, literally just mapped the positions of all those stars, figured out that, that one of those stars ends up getting around the galactic center, moving at like single digit percentages of yes. the speed of light. And basically was like, uh, there's something with a lot of mass sitting there. And that yeah. kind of, that was big with it. Um, and then obviously observational evidence build up, built upon that as well. Um, but in science, you know, you always have to be open. So it wasn't like 100% confirmed. Um, and then LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO came along LIGO. and basically put the feather in the cap and detected gravitational waves of two, gra uh, two gravitational waves, two black holes combining together. And that was basically like, yep, they're a thing, confirmed. Of, you know, officially official, and now we've gone and taken an actual, like, resolvable image of a black hole as well. And I kind of want to, can we go back to that image real quick? Because I want to talk about this image and what you're actually looking at here um, in terms of what you can see in here. So everybody's looking at this dark bit right here and going, whoa, that's a gnarly event horizon. But this actually isn't technically the event horizon. This is a shadow that's being cast by the event horizon. The event horizon's still deep. Um, within there. And also, this right here, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the black hole here, we're not looking straight down or straight at it. Uh, M87's black hole is kind of tilted towards us here in the Milky Way. So this is material that's actually in front of the black hole to us. And then this up here is actually material that's directly behind the black hole. But the, the, gr the gravity here is bending that light so much that we're able to look behind the black hole just by the light bending around it like that. So this is actually, this right here is behind the black hole. This is in front. So we can see this directly. We're only seeing this because of the of just the gravity that's there. Insane. It's absurd. And then this right here is like three times the, the size of our solar system like yeah. from out to the orbit to Neptune. So. There was an actually ab absolutely fascinating video of uh, somebody doing an, a uh, model visualization of what that actually looks like and where all that that all the data comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, we should put a link to that in the definitely in the note, show notes. Yeah, we certainly will. Um, and what was so cool about this too is that they modeled what the image should look like based upon our understanding of physics 
with everything with that. So mm -hmm. we, we did that and uh, we ran it through supercomputers and we're basically like, this is what it should look like. And this is what that image that we get should look like. And bah -ha! It, bam, it was almost a perfect match. Exactly. So basically physics as we understand it presently is pretty good. Still working. So still, still working. working. Obviously problems, you know, Dark matter, dark energy, but we're working on it. We're getting so, there. We're getting there. Yeah. And and one last thing I want to say about this, again, tying it back into kind of its like pub like the, the impact on the public and society. The memes that were generated following this photo's release on the oh internet my gosh. did not disappoint. Do you have some memes? Right. <clears throat> I don't. Oh, okay. My favorite one happens to be incredibly inappropriate. But <laughs> there are some look them up. Just just Google it. Um <laughs> they're all really good. So <laughs> my favorite one uh, was uh, like somebody had like a box of Krispy Kremes and there was like 12 of the, of the black hole images. One of it. my favorite is like there's like a hand like secretly like this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my it's God. like, I get it, you internet, you're funny. I, I just want to say one more thing about that image, just because of how amazing it is. And just, it's kind of one of those things that's like, this is the best of humanity. Like, when we all come together, this is the amazing exactly. stuff that we can end up doing. Um, taking an image of this black hole and resolving it with as much detail as we did, basically it's the equivalent of pointing a optical telescope from Los Angeles to New York, so across the entire United States, which is big, so I've been told. Yes. So comp uh, compared to places like Europe and stuff, it actually does take a while to get across the United States. Oh, West Perth so, expansion. Yeah, you know, just with everything Louisiana like that. Louisiana Purchase, really. Yeah. What well, can we say? Big <laughs> man is big. Um, so it's like looking from LA to New York, seeing that somebody's reading a newspaper and being able to discern the period at the end of the sentence. I can't reading. even do that with a newspaper in front of my face. <laughs> I, I it's just, amazing. <laughs> it's just mind exactly boggling. The implications of just yeah. yeah that and Prismara has a really good uh, has a really good uh, comment right here, which is if we can do this with a radio dish the size of the Earth, imagine what we could do with hundreds of radio telescopes in orbit around the Sun, a dish the size of a solar system. That would be absolutely absurd. So, and uh, In the best way. Possible. Yeah, that would I just yeah holy smokes that would just blow me away with that there. Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, earlier in the show, we talked about cold, dark places, mm, right? My so, favorite. Yeah, some good stuff. All, all the cold, fun happens dark, in cold, wet places. cold, dark, moist places. <laughs> Swampy. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's also a word I don't ever want to hear. Again. <laughs> um, this one, though, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of the year. Like, Is literally it? the beginning of the year. As yeah. in, like, the opening minutes of 2019 because the New Horizons spacecraft on January 1st when all of us were partying uh, there was a bunch of scientists that were busy having it fly by having this a thing science party right here yeah 2014 MU69 also known as Ultima Thule right here and this is uh, sort of one of the better images uh, that we have of it so far a composite of all the different images that New Horizons took in true color as well mm -hmm. so it really is sort of this uh, this like reddish brown with it there. So pretty cool place. It's what we call a classical cold Kuiper belt object. So what, is, what does that mean? What is that? Well, it's not like Pluto. Pluto is a Kuiper belt object. Mm -hmm. Regardless of whether you think it's a planet or a dwarf planet, Pluto is a Kuiper belt object. Um, so it is close enough to the sun that the influence or the sun has influenced it. Yeah. It has chemically changed exactly. uh, portions of its surface and other things like that. Um, so we would, we would expect to find very complex things on Pluto. Not essentially like what we would expect to find our universe started out with. Oh. Um, and just to let you know here, this is <laughs> ultimately in the flesh. Uh, uh, right yes, yeah, so this was a sample uh, return mission. Yes, a sample. It, it came back with an Hayabusa 3. Uh, new, <laughs> new Hayabusa, or Hayabusa yeah. Horizon, anyways. Uh, so, um, I guess since I'm holding this, I should talk a little bit about no, this really No, no, cool, just pretend it's not this, even there. Yeah, so, um, yeah, well, it's my therapist told me. Um, <laughs> that was not nice. Anyways, sorry, Ult I'm sorry, Ultima. Uh, so, uh, it looks like, it's, it looks, they, used, they jokingly called it the snowman. You know, yeah. It, kinda, it looks like a snowman. Woohoo. You know, everything with that there. So, with this snowman, they flew behind New Horizons, and then they looked at Ultima Thule as they went past. And there's an amazing gif that comes from that. Go on. So 
And that GIF or GIF or whatever you want to call it um, actually it's ends up showing that. us that ultimately is not these spherical things. <gasps> it's slender. Oh my gosh! It's it's got it's 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 slimmed down so much more than we were expecting it to. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. What? So that is such an interesting shape. The, the yes. one thing that always like fascinates me is like the shapes that these objects take on out there. Because consider, mm -hmm. I mean, so what's the main composition of Ultima Thule? Like, what's it mainly comprised of? Uh, so it is mostly water ice. Exactly. It's also got uh, methanol on oh. the surface. And there's also uh, complex organics on there. So basically exactly. stuff with carbon in it. So what's so cool about that is water at those distances away from the sun in those temperatures, it's really like, it's like harder than rock. That's why those mountains on Pluto yes. are able to get so huge. They're made of water ice yeah. and they're essentially indestructible at those temperatures. Yeah, those 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 mountains on Pluto are like five kilometers tall. Insane, That's yeah. And it's all water ice. It's not like- That's like, okay. That, it's not rock like And on here something on the size of Pluto, that's like a that's like a one foot tall person with like six like like eighteen inch biceps. Jeez. Like it's just weird and very interesting. Um, but essentially, yeah, like going back to the general shape of it. I mean, there it is. There we go. Oh, oh, the little duck. So when we were approaching with New Horizons, there was no real light curve with uh, Ultima Thule. It was just basically a flat brightness, and they were kind of worried about that, as in, like, what's going on? Is yeah. there lots of debris in this area or things like that? Nope, it just turns out that it's literally rotating just at the spacecraft. We happen to fly <laughs> right at the pole of it that nice. it rotates on. Yeah. So, um, so, like, <laughs> just our luck, right, that we yeah. end up getting this rotation that we're just, like, you know, Steering right down the barrel. And also just our luck too that it so. was a relatively uh, debris-free ride going yeah. towards it because that was a big concern. Was you know we need to have a clear path or else mm -hmm. bye bye yeah. space. You run into it. I, yeah, uh, I mean seriously, New Horizons went past at like 14 kilometers per second. So <laughs> exactly. That's gonna. I mean you don't want to hit a snowflake at that speed. So oh, <laughs> you mean one here, of us? I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> Millennials. <laughs> Here is that amazing shot that New Horizons took uh, as it went uh, past Ultima Thule. Um, uh, and that is what allowed us to basically figure out that it awesome. really does have this, this very slim pancake-like shape with it there. And what that tells us is that, that, first of all, we were pretty confident that these are two separate objects. So this was all by itself at one point. This was all by itself at one point. They were orbiting independently. And then they kind of came together and they stuck and they got, they sticked or they stuck it or whatever you want to call it. And seeing it like this, you know, flat on like this ends up telling us that they did not collide. They did not combine at a tremendous velocity. It was not an energetic combination. Or else it would be more like a cohesive. It would be more cohesive, more it. deformed it, in this yeah. area as well. Um, so it's when you- like they kissed and then- Yeah, now kiss. Got stuck. So, um, so <laughs> like when you see uh, the comet that Rosetta orbited, Churuyama uh, Gerasimenko, uh, or 67P, whichever you prefer, um, this, um, that, that comet, was a very that was a that was a impact that had some good energy behind it because absolutely it squished in here. Um, but ultimately, did not have that. They think scientists think that they actually combined at about a couple feet per second, or as they said at the press conference, it's like slow motion. Like at the press conference, <laughs> they said that it was probably about the speed that a cat walks that they. Came I together. love. Can we only measure speeds by the the speed that cats, <laughs> cats walk? walk? Yeah, sure. So, we yeah. sure could. So. Yeah, so the Great. flyby was at roughly uh, 30,000 30, times the speed of a cat walking. Um, there right we go. There. And what I love about this is that ultimately it's very far away. It is too far away to have been greatly influenced by exactly. the sun. It's a time capsule. So it's, it's a, it is a time capsule. So this is not, this is not the foundation of, of what we are made out of. This is what the foundation itself is made out of. So this is this is this is not us. This is before us. Yes. This is beyond primordial. It does not exactly. get much older than this in our solar system. And that's what's so exciting about it. Absolutely. Um, 
New Horizons is very far away. This flyby occurred at 6.6 .6 billion kilometers from the Earth. Uh, New Horizons transmitter is only 15 watts of power. So imagine trying to listen to that from that far away. It means we're only getting about one to two kilobits per second of data. So even though it took all that data in on basically what was a several hour long flyby on January 1st of this year, that data is going to take till September of next year to finally all get downloaded. Yeah. But they're working with it, and uh, I'm and excited to see what comes out of it, though. I am too. Um, I'm also very excited because they're supposed to be starting very soon a survey with the imagers, the imaging systems on New Horizons, to see if there are any targets beyond that New Horizons may be able to yes. maneuver to. And I'm very excited about Radical. that because I would love to see an even further out Ultima Thule and see what that how looks like. How much more classical it. can you get? So, how much more classical? How much more cold? How much more Kuiper can you get? <laughs> it's very Kuiper. So, do you have? Can you handle this? You better loosen your belt because there's so much Kuiper in this, <laughs> with all these objects happening in there. Oh, it spun away. So that was pretty good. <laughs> Bye. So yeah. So. We also had uh, quite a large number of honorable mentions that we want to give off uh, as well with this. Uh, and basically a vast majority of these were suggested by a multitude of members on our, uh, on our community at community.tmro.tv. Uh, we want to talk about Chang'e 4, which was China's second lunar lander yes. on the surface of the moon. And specifically it was the first anything to land on the far side of the moon. It was suggested by uh, uh, our community uh, to talk about that a little bit. Uh, had a little rover called U-22, which moved out. It also had an experiment on board, which you, you talked about uh, a little bit. Oh, here. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is the first time anything's been grown on the moon. And while mm -hmm. it's not being grown directly on the moon, it's definitely in its own little biosphere. Um, but this is organics being grown in the environment of the moon. And that is huge, especially because, you know, we love to talk about the potential for going to the moon and all the cool things we could do once we're there. Yeah, and you got to make your you, you would like to have a system that allows you to make food. While to you're grow, the, yeah, the growing moon, organics so. has so many benefits, whether yeah. it's generating food, oxygen. Food, yeah. uh, wastewater cleanup, uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide scrubbing. Sanity it's, for the humans who I, want to see something alive. Really, honestly, it is, it is psychologically beneficial for you to actually see something like a plant. And I would love to take like some orchids or something to the moon with me. Yeah. That would be pretty cool, some lunar orchids. Uh, with it. Also, um, a little bit uh, from Perry uh, on our community.tmro.tv, uh, talked about the Bereshit lander, which was uh, Israel's attempt to land on the moon by Space IL. Unfortunately, they had a problem with a gyroscope, yeah. which caused the shutdown of the uh, main engine, and it ended up, uh, it did technically reach the surface of the moon just at about one kilometer per second so which is usually yes. it's not a good speed um with that there but uh but hats off i mean no private entity had done that before exactly uh, with that so that was that was impressive and, and, yeah and, and, just, and, and yeah i was just gonna say and it's so cool to see such a global effort to all of a sudden be accomplishing all of these the things moon. it's no it's longer so just right two now. big places yeah it really is. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. Also, a big shout out to Space IL as well. They had a lot of problems with their optical navigation cameras, and they worked through those problems and got it to the moon, and got it in orbit, and got it actually close to where they wanted to land it on yeah. the moon, even with those problems. So uh, that's that's impressive. Still incredibly impressive. Yeah. I gotta say, very yeah, proud very of yourself. Uh, one of my favorite stories of the year, which is the VF01 flight of VSS Unity. Uh, this flight from Virgin Galactic. Yes. Uh, didn't just have two pilots on board. It also had Beth Moses, who is the astronaut trainer, on board. So uh, there you go. Uh, the two pilots and Beth uh, got their uh, commercial astronaut wings from the FAA because uh, we're soon we're soon going to be ditching the is Pluto a planet debate and start uh, start the is 80 kilometers space debate uh, with this here, uh, which we can definitely have uh, fisticuffs someday um, on this show <laughs> Let's about. Do it right now. Yeah, but uh, uh, just it's it's really great to see Virgin Galactic moving ahead with everything. Absolutely. Um, uh, especially after the the problems they've had and just yeah. seeing them. I want to say soar, you know, literally into the skies uh, with the work that they're doing. But I'm very excited. Um, I definitely would what love to ride on that. 
Uh, so Richard, if you're listening, uh, hook, hook me up. Yo, uh, Branson. I'll, I'll make it happen. Um, also, Blue Origin, too, with New Shepard is yeah. making advancements as well. They're actually carrying payloads exactly. um, on their microgravity flights uh, with, with uh, their capsule and, and their booster. And um, that's very exciting, too, because and, yeah. now you don't have to pay a couple million to put your experiment on a CubeSat. Right? If you need a couple minutes of weightlessness, you just toss some money at, uh, at Blue Origin. And it's a you know, you couple tens of thousands of dollars to make it happen. And uh, Hanny's war rip was correct. Yes, this is a beautiful beautiful mm. machine yeah. gorgeous i i i mean i know that Welcome space planes moment. are inherently more dangerous than capsules but i also like just don't care <laughs> about that either because they're just not only are they inherently more dangerous they're also inherently more beautiful so just want to throw that out there hey there's us like people. that's us that's los angeles right there we're actually the studio is behind the boom right there so cool. what do you know so that's pretty cool so and then, oh my gosh, yes, can you believe it? Finally, Oh. the demonstration mission one from SpaceX. Oh, I know, Crew right? Dragon, ah, look at it, gosh, there it goes, ah. there it goes. Oh my gosh, this was so exciting because we've been talking about the commercial uh, CC dev, you know, commercial crew development for gosh, years now. Ah, so who's counting? It's just been going on and, uh, and here we are. So we are officially uh, not that far away now, months. Maybe a year, I don't know, uh, till uh, we officially start carrying crew. And uh, this was the first flight of a Crew Dragon. Um, and it, from all accounts, did very, very well. Obviously, there's things that you have to contend with. That's why you do test flights. Um, and uh, there's Ripley with the, uh, did they give the Earth a name? I don't think they gave the Earth mm. a name. Did they give the Earth a name? I don't I don't think so. They just call it, we'll just call it Earth. There's <laughs> Ripley in the Earth in there. And then here it is on approach. Oh my gosh, that is such a cool HUD. That is Little amazing. Earth. With that there. Little Earth. Okay, thank you very much. There it is on approach. I'm, I can hear the blue Danube uh, in, my, <laughs> in my head right now with it there. But this is, this is so exciting to watch this happening um, because soon people are going to be riding in that. Although not that specific capsule because unfortunately on April 20th this year during a test of their Super, Super Draco thrusters for the launch escape system for it, it, it exploded. And it exploded. They didn't uh, even have to reach out and grab this one. It just came right up and booped them on the nose. Yeah, look at that. It just, you know, did that very, very nicely. Um, with a docking adapter that a cargo dragon took up, by the way, as well. So just in case you want to know. Uh, so very, very cool that we're, uh, that we're back and doing that again. So bam. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, we got to talk about Starlink because astronomers have been freaking uh, out. Yeah. Um, just a little bit about Starlink, but a, a lot of us are still very excited about it because this is going to be satellite internet. This is going to be orbit, uh, opening up uh, access to the internet to anybody on this exactly. planet who democratizing can... access to literally the largest hub of information in the world. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't think of a better thing to do for humanity. Absolutely. Honestly. In the 21st century, that is the best thing you can because do. Because as, as has been often talked about off air uh, here, is that there are places where it is very That's difficult to get knowledge. Yeah, exactly. So, and this is going to hopefully open up that ability to allow anyone all, to get yeah. whatever kind of knowledge they and need. And all it takes that. is a kid yeah, to watch the right, you know, YouTube video of a, of a rocket launch. And all of a sudden, you have just inspired you know, just the next generation of people who are going to get us to the farthest reaches in space. Yeah, so. and this is uh, the first, uh, I guess, Slavo, the first launch of what will be a very large number of satellites in excess, I think, of 11,000 now, yeah. just from SpaceX alone. Um, so uh, getting ready to test that and work with that. Uh, this has often been cited as a critical part of the revenue stream in order to make Mars happen at SpaceX. Um, so we'll see what happens because no satellite internet provider has succeeded ever. So we'll have to see how it goes um, with that. And Hayes Vorwerp on Twitch is asking, how many years will it take to deploy all these satellites? And I actually do not know. I am unaware of that, and I'm not. Is there going a to, schedule? I'm not going to try to pull the wool <laughs> over your eyes about that either. Yeah, I don't know. So uh, that's. Uh, but hey, uh, it, it will take a while. <laughs> but they can launch 60 at a time. So 11,000 divided by 60. Um, that's a number. It. So yeah. yeah. And then Artemis. Yeah. Artemis. Well. Are you excited about Artemis? I mean, of course I am. I'm pretty excited about Artemis yeah. too. Um, also excited about uh, Clips the Commercial Lunar Payload Services mm -hmm. Program mm -hmm. that NASA oh. is doing. Uh, they already have three that they uh, have contracts with to basically send small payloads 
uh, for NASA or other uh, commercial partners to the surface of the moon with. Mm -hmm. uh, so very, very excited uh, to see them uh, doing that and yeah. moving ahead with that. And the, you know, the moon, it's so hot right now. Yeah, you know, speaking of the moon, we also had the amazing 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. Yes. We just actually wrapped that up. We're in the month of it. And um, I is. mean, self-explanatory, really. I don't think we have to go too in depth as to, gosh, that's cool. Um, just the relevance. And again, uh, just to see everybody so excited about it and to see all the amazing programming. In fact, BBC America featured um, some of us turkeys from tomorrow. Yeah, um, I can't believe that that happened. I still so, am like, yeah. in shock over that. It's pretty wild. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, so. Yeah. Did you watch the NASA do the, st the uh, stream of this in real time? I did. At, so, yeah. I watched it too. And my internet froze right as Neil was taking the step. Oh. And I was literally like, this is the future we get to look forward to <laughs> with that Mars mission. So Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, but oh my gosh, it was so exciting. There was so much good stuff and also uh, so amazing to hear from Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin. I know, uh, right? There. Michael Collins is like the guy that you never hear from. And he is so eloquent. He is so poetic. So classy. And his Twitter feed is so funny as <laughs> well. Um, just like... I'm, he's hilarious. He's he's great. I love I I love them all. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. So, and then we're gonna go over to India because I mean, moon, 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 moon. So why don't we talk a little bit about India, who Please. is going to be going to the moon with their second uh, second mission to the moon called Chandrayaan two, which launched just earlier this week. This is going to be an orbiter with a lander, and that lander has a rover on it, and uh, they will actually be doing the first landing at the Lunar South Pole, which is exactly where we are looking at sending humans for Artemis, um, because if there's water ice there, you can use that water ice there uh, for things like water, yeah. oxygen, rocket fuel, a whole bunch of other things uh, that you could do with that. So uh, super excited uh, that landing will happen in early September. So we're still a little bit of a time away from it. Uh, but if they do that, uh, India will become the fourth country to land on the moon. Um, and <laughs> aren't you a little short for a rocket? Let me tell you, <laughs> uh, that launch vehicle from India has got some pep to it. So uh, it's, it's pretty tough. And also, this is so cool that like now all across the Earth, it's yes. not just the United States. Not it's just not Russia. just Russia. It's not just China. India's getting in on exactly. it now. And Japan's also talking about getting in on this now as well. So it's just so exciting. And just think like when we, you know, and like you said, it's, this is all, space is such a collaborative effort and to see all these nations participate and then to, you know, imagine the future where we all just kind of like, mm -hmm. I hate to use the word, it's a buzzword, synergize. <laughs> imagine the amazing things we can accomplish. Yeah. And it doesn't just bring out the best of the United States. It doesn't just bring out the best of Russia or China. Oh, yeah. It brings out the best in all of us. Exactly. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I adore space with that. Also, talking a little bit about China, uh, they also had their Hyperbola 1 launch, which was the first private orbital launch vehicle success outside of the U.S. from China. And this was suggested by Wicked. Uh, and there it goes. Uh, it is made out of a bunch of solid motors that have, have been bought. So the company iSpace that did this uh, not entirely their design, but I still don't want to detract from what they did because launching a vehicle into space is not easy. So uh -uh. If, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? So, and there's only a handful of people uh, that end up doing that. And uh, yeah, so congratulations. I'm really looking forward uh, to seeing what happens in the future with this. Um, and competition's good. Competition's healthy. Absolutely. Everybody wins when we have competition for stuff like this. So very exciting. And uh, Robert Allen from YouTube is uh, saying, now we must discuss Hopper and Starship. And, you know, I mean, come on. We got to, that was basically what everybody wanted to talk yeah. about in the, in the community post. There it is. The flying water tank. <laughs> Oh my god. Exterminate. Gosh. Exterminate. Exterminate. <laughs> <laughs> what is Methalox? <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's all I'm going to do. Put that there. Uh, yep, so Starhopper took its jump. Yeah. Um, and actually, Ben and I have a bet. Uh, is it a dollar bet or are we, no, we're still sticking with it. Okay. So, uh, we, I we took a bet back in, oh my gosh, what was it? Like March of 2018, I think. Um, where I said uh, that if Starhopper flies over 96 meters, if it flies higher than 96 meters by the end of 2019, so December 31st, 2019, um, I will eat an entire Rocketdyne RS-25D with mustard. So what is what? That's a space shuttle main engine. No, so. but you're gonna eat an entire. 
I'm gonna eat a rocket engine. Yeah. 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 With mustard. Can. So. Okay. Yeah. So. We're looking up uh, information on Elon's Twitter account to uh, to see if we can. Comment I'm further. gonna just go ahead and say that I'm gonna be there to see that. That was a 20 meter jump. That was not the actual. No, it was hop. not. You're right. You're right. That, that was a 20 meter jump. Actual. Hop. We're, we're looking up. We're looking up some more information. So stand by. Okay. All right. I, I mean, close out the show, right. and then maybe we'll something. Yeah. Up. Sure. All right. I, <laughs> basically, I'm gonna end up eating an engine by the an end of this year. Engine. Probably within a couple of weeks. Uh, so, which will be fine because I'll be start really, practicing. I'll be really hungry when I get back from a trip. So that'll be fun. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say these kinds of bets and stuff. They're always for fun, and also these are the kinds of things that I have zero issues being wrong about because I love seeing stuff like this. Absolutely. Moving forward. I'm not yeah. trying to make fun of them or anything. I know the other day somebody got mad at me on Twitter because I said that the uh, that the uh, fire truck. At uh, Bolsa Chica's traveled a longer distance than Starhopper has, but you know, anyway, <laughs> that's a whole other story. So that was just oh, a, it was you. a joke, people. It was a joke. All right, so all right, let's go on. Let's wrap this up. Yeah, you want to so wrap? I wrap would love it. to. Thank you guys so Get much it. for joining us. Um, as you can see, 2019 has already been epically amazing, and it's going to be way amazing. There's as so we, much more stuff to happen this, this year. So many activities. I don't even so know how we're going to record on all of them. I don't know either. So. Just kidding. We're stoked about it. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for joining. And of course, you folks are the ones that make this show possible. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have uh, different tiers of citizens who support us, like such as the Escape Velocity, um, uh, the Orbital Citizens, and of course, the um, Suborbital. Sub -orbital. You know. And, and then you, can't, are... you also have ground support, too. Exactly. Because you, you can't be flying stuff without ground support. No, you can't. So. No, you can't. You can't eat rocket engines without ground support. That's right. And uh, these are all folks who contribute... Um, monthly amount uh, via Patreon, patreon.com slash TMRO, and they literally make this show run. They make it possible. They also, are... also now, you can go to youtube.com slash TMRO slash join, and you can actually fund us directly through YouTube now. And on, okay. on the YouTube version, so on Patreon, there's a certain amount that you have to give. On YouTube, you can literally do like, what is it, a dollar, one dollar for the entire no. month. So if you get something out of this and you feel like it's worth one dollar for the entire month, feel free. Or we, we appreciate anything and absolutely. everything. It all counts, and do. even non-monetarily, so. you know, smash that like button, share this with your bestest friends, yeah. send it in your work email Subscribe, to all your coworkers, like notifications, exactly, uh, all that good stuff. Community.tmro.tv. Get, Talk to get us. active back on Talk there as us. well. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And our Twitter at tmro as well. So feel free to contact yeah. us. Uh, however you need to and I believe on that that pretty much wraps it up for the show So we hope that you enjoyed your review of 2019 so far I have a feeling we're gonna be doing another review at the end of the year Absolutely. Um, and there's probably gonna be a rocket engine there for me to eat so <laughs> Thanks for watching 12.23 everybody and we'll see you next time